to talk about where we are with 5G today um, and how the environment that's being created right now for local government um, really starts to have to shift and talk about the focus on your infrastructure and how you play a role in that whole ecosystem for developing 5G and all the capabilities that it can bring to your city. So let me start. And hopefully you'll be able to see my screen here in just a moment. All right. Um, I will absolutely own the fact that I have shamelessly borrowed a few slides from colleagues of mine around the country because I think they've done a great job at framing up this conversation. So I, I think we all feel like smart city is a term that's been used so frequently that I think it gets lost sometimes in, in what the true meaning of becoming a smart city actually is. And I think at the core, this, this particular slide really does a good job of summing up what we're talking about when we're looking at the challenges of becoming a smart city today. And part of that challenge is using your infrastructure and parlaying that infrastructure into platforms and services that help you become more efficient um, in local government. Um, offering services to your citizens that will improve the quality of their life. Um, and, and you've heard many of those and we'll talk about them in, in just a minute. But a lot of this is dependent upon relationships that you build with the public and private sector. Um, and those private sector organizations like ours and Voxel Maps come to you to bring you the tools and services to enable you to start using your infrastructure and building the platforms that you need necessary in your city to become a smart city and be able to meet the needs of your citizens from a digital perspective. So in, in terms of the wireless evolution, and I, I do feel like I've dated myself because I started working in wireless back in 1992 exactly, um, before any of us knew what all the G's were going to mean in our future. And I, I love this slide because I think it frames up where we've come over the last 35 years. What's really interesting to me is, you know, we started in a phone call, kind of what I call the send and end only environment. And we've progressed over the years through the decades of coming from just a phone to a phone and a text message to now what you're holding in your hand is really a small computer. Um, it can enable you with global features and functionalities. And that's what's so exciting about 5G and all the things we keep hearing, the promises of what 5G can deliver to us. And that's all built in the latency response times um, that this technology is going to offer. Um, the pipeline that it brings to you is incredible in terms of the services that it can enable. What's interesting when we talk about the benefits of 5G, um, I read an article recently that said no American is ever further than three feet away from their cell phone device, no matter what it is. Um, and that's pretty staggering when you think about that. And I know I'm guilty of that. Probably all of us sitting here on the call today have our phones sitting to our left or right on our desk, and we're probably multitasking with it while we do this. That's why the benefits of 5G are so strong, because in order to become a smart city, you, you want to use your infrastructure to create and use these benefits, whether it comes to rural America, or we're talking about smart farming and the results of that, to one of the biggest topics we hear about are autonomous vehicles and being able to offer those types of services through the 5G technology. Further, one of the secondary benefits that's probably getting even more play is telehealth and medical services so you can get out to your aging community through telemedicine so that they get the help that they need if they're not close to a hospital in proximity. It also will help you from an artificial intelligent perspective because it's going to bring you data that will help you create services online, whether it's educational, whether it's utility based, whether it's for your first responders in your city. And so it's so important to have this infrastructure in place for you to be able to develop all these services and offer them to your citizens um, here as we watch 5G roll out across the states. This last slide that I wanna talk about, it's, it's a fairly busy slide. And again, this is from our friends at Smart City Labs. Um, this is a depiction right now of kind of where we've come and, and what the vision is for a smart city. And I think what's really important here is when you get down to the sidewalk level and you see these light posts that have small cells enabling the signals that will build the dense network needed for you to enjoy 5G services. 
And what I like about it is let's talk about the focus of a city and the critical role you play in deploying that network. I know many of you have attended probably some of the other webinars we've hosted where we talk about the importance of your infrastructure. But really, in today's environment, in order for you to enjoy things like being able to offer better utilities and energy services, or smart parking, or even being able from a sustainability perspective to have air quality sensors in your community, you have to have your infrastructure in place to do so. One of the things that the industry has spent a lot of time talking about is how important it is for them to be able to utilize your public rights of way to build that dense network. Um, and it is a key factor because in order to use 5G and have things like autonomous vehicles, your infrastructure becomes more and more crucial to the deployment of 5G. And I think at the end of the day, while there has been a lot of tense conversation between local government, for sure, and the industry, I think no one would argue the fact that everyone is looking forward to 5G and the services that it can provide. And I think from that perspective, where it becomes such a crucial role for the public sector in this ecosystem is in planning and emphasizing broadband master planning and how important that is to your community. Because if you don't have that plan in place, then you're not able to identify those resources that help build that dense network. And, and that is crucial in being able to deploy and utilize these services. And so I, I say all this to kind of give a snapshot of where we are. And, and I think this slide in particular does a great job of that because what it's saying is between 2020 and 2023, we're going to see hundreds of thousands of these small cell deployments put in place to start enabling those networks. We've seen small pockets of 5G. The truth of the matter is where we see 5G claims, those are usually wireline claims. So they're competing more from a cable perspective with your Xfinities of the world, but not necessarily yet in a true device that is 5G enabled that can start to benefit from some of these services. So we're somewhat on the, the bleeding edge of where this technology is, is preparing us to go. And so it's a very exciting time. And with that, you know, I want to shift over to Peter because where I get really excited about this and the time that I've spent on this topic over the last several years is now we're starting to see more innovation and tools come forward to help you quickly identify your most valuable resources across your city and help you gain that data fairly quickly so that you can start to enable yourselves to do that broadband master planning. And so when I had the opportunity to meet Voxel Maps and, and Peter and his team, um, the synergies there were incredible. And I think it's a really important tool and message for all of you today that have joined us to start to understand that the number one thing that you need to get a hold of right now is taking stock of your current infrastructure. And so with that, I want to transition the conversation and talk a little bit with Peter about, you know, Voxel Maps and, and what mapping your, your assets really, really looks like in today's environment. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Peter, so that you can start sharing yours and, and I'll let you um, take the baton from here to talk a little bit about Voxel Maps. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, Hello everybody, it's a pleasure to be here today and have the, the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing with Voxel Maps and, and also how this relates to smart cities as well and, and 5G. Um, so what I want to do is just take you through a, a few slides here just to, to illustrate the concept of what we're doing. It's quite a radical new approach to, to mapping and looking at infrastructure as well. So just, just moving forward, the, the key things are really maps are the foundation stones for smart cities. Um, so when we're looking at this, um, spatial analysis is absolutely key to understanding the, the infrastructure, both in terms of existing infrastructure and also infrastructure that may need to be deployed as well. You, you basically need to know what you have and, and where it is. Um, and you know, when we start to then look at the, the kind of data that's produced from you know, these devices, either you know, Internet of Things or 5G, there's huge amounts of data and all of this data is spatially referenced. It's, in fact, it's not just spatial, it has a temporal component as well. So that means that um, maps become key to really understanding and analyzing the data. You know, in particular, think, things like you know, traffic flow, um, people movement, you know, air quality, as uh, Angela mentioned as well. So, so maps, you know, they form the foundation from a planning perspective, but also from 
analysis, from visualization, and then the ongoing monitoring and continued improvement of all of these things as well. Now, this is where we feel that there's a little bit of an issue. Uh, when we think about you know, maps as they stand today, these were predominantly designed to navigate humans to buildings and to street addresses. They weren't really designed for you know, the 3D world that we now live in, particularly when it comes to smart cities and uh, various you know, IoT kind of components and sensors there. So you know, there's an opportunity to really look at mapping in, in a completely different way. And that's really what we've done uh, at Voxel. So, so with Voxel, we have kind of three core components to our technology. Um, we have what we call a high definition volumetric mapping platform, which I'll, I'll explain what that is. Uh, but this is something that's around true 3D, and I'll explain, explain that. Um, we then have a hardware which can be easily fitted onto any vehicle, um, and it consists of LiDAR, so laser scanning. We can, we can talk a little bit about that as well. And it allows you to, to map and understand the city uh, very quickly, uh, much more rapidly than traditional mapping or GIS methods as well. And then most importantly, we have a system that then leverages that data and uses artificial intelligence to recognize key assets and features and automatically extract those, those features as well. So starting with the first of these, uh, I wanna talk about what 3D mapping is. And you know, I'm sure most of you have kind of seen um, you know, 3D maps in, in terms of Google, um, you know, where you have a two, really this is what we call a two and a half D map. It's a 2D map with some 3D objects on it as well. Um, and you know, that looks 3D, but in reality, it's just an empty mesh of a building. There's no information you know, that's actually contained in there. So again, it's just a visualization technique. It's not really measuring the, the 3D world. So with voxel maps, we were really thinking about this next generation. And what we were building was a true volumetric representation of, of the matter of the planet. So we wanted to combine that with high definition accuracy. So that means 10 centimeters or less in terms of absolute positioning on the planet. And then a dimensional resolution of around two centimeters. So the advantage here is as well as being able to map where something is, you can measure attributes, features, the size of it as well, which was, which was really important. And, and this wasn't just about using LiDAR alone. We wanted to, to include cameras. So we kind of create a system that really has the benefit of true spatial intelligence, you know, being able to understand creating a model of everything and understanding what that is. So the way that we did that, or the way that we approached it is to use voxels. Now, I, I'm sure some of you might have heard of voxels, others might not have done. Um, so a voxel is just a 3D pixel. So think about you know, just a cube. And voxels aren't necessarily new. They've actually been used in computer gaming for quite a long time. So this is a, a screenshot from Minecraft. I don't know if any of you maybe played this game yourself or maybe your children might have played it. But this is quite a popular game. And it's a game that's actually rendered using voxels rather than polygons. You kind of get this blocky world that's, that's kind of been generated. But voxels have also been used in another field, and that's robotics. And so they're used in a field in robotics to um, simplify the data that LIDARs are producing. And so we took that concept, something called voxel occupancy grids, and we were using that essentially to, to map the planet. So what we did is we created what's called an MR VOG, and that stands for a multi-resolutional voxel occupancy grid. So, so what we did is we took the planet and we placed a giant cube over the planet. And, and this cube is just a theoretical cube, but it's, it's made up of these uh, individual uh, voxels. And these are multi-resolutional. Uh, they can actually be any size. So you know, for our purposes, we use eight meter voxels down to two centimeter voxels, but they could be any size. So this is just a visualization, gives you an idea that wherever you're sat at the moment, uh, indoors or outdoors, there is this grid of these virtual 3D voxels around you. Now, uh, to start with, this is just an addressing system. You know, think of it as you know, the lines, the reference lines you would see on a traditional map. Um, but this is a 3D version of that. So there's no data in it. But when we look at the voxels, each voxel has a permanent position in space. Uh, so it, it never changes and a unique address. So what we then do is we use LiDAR sensors. Um, so LiDAR sensors are a laser-based scanner. Um, and what happens is as the, the, the scanner moves through the environment, so imagine it you know, on top of a vehicle, it's sending these laser beams and, and scanning the area. If a laser beam passes through a voxel and there's, there's nothing, it's not reflected back, then we label this as free space. Um, but if it hits a voxel um, or hits matter, 
we collapse down to the smallest unit of the voxel and we label this as occupied. So in essence, what we're doing is we're etching out the matter of the planets, the true volumetric uh, matter of the planet. So that gives a, a view of something like this. So, so this is uh, data that we've collected in Orange County um, around Irvine. Um, and this is just from a single pass using our sensor, which, which I'll show you. Um, and this is just occupancy. So this, this blue area is actually a 3D world. Imagine it like a computer game. And all of the, the gray blocks you see here are voxels. And they, these are measurements you know, of, of uh, the matter that's there. So already, just by using that, we can see a lot of features. We can see trees, the road surface. We can see signs on the road. We can see vehicles, the sidewalks, and the curbs. But where it becomes really interesting is when we then overlay image data. So, so the sensor that we have has LIDAR and it also has cameras as well. So then the, the cameras start to provide the colors to those voxels, to those cubes. And then what you start to create then is a scene that looks you know, much more identifiable from the point of view of uh, a human being understanding it. So again, this is a, a, seat, a street in LA. You can see this is one single pass of data but it's reconstructed a whole 3D model of that. And you can see very clearly the lines, the curbs, the sidewalk, even pedestrians and, and buildings on that as well. So, so once you've now created this, this 3D model, we can then uh, apply artificial intelligence to really understand the features. So, so this is a technology we call VAMS. And what we're doing here, I'm, I'm showing you two sides of, uh, of, of the system. So on one side, the AI is trained to recognize almost any attribute or feature um, that is required you know, typically in a smart city. You know, so everything from telegraph poles to street lights, to hydrants, to sidewalks, to, to streets themselves. And it can also be trained to recognize other additional features. So, so in this uh, diagram or picture on the left, you can see that all of the different features we're extracting have a different color. And that's actually the artificial intelligence recognizing those features. So you, you collect the data and then you don't have to manually process it. Uh, the software and the AI runs through the data and very rapidly recognizes the features and extracts those features into any data set. But it's not just about recognizing the features and where they are, it's also about measuring them as well. So in this example here where you start to see these blocks, these blocks are calculating the different dimensions of the features that we're looking at. And so we can recognize an, an asset or a feature, we can extract that, plus all of the attributes around it automatically. So this becomes actually a very powerful and, and useful tool for a smart city. So how do we actually go and collect the data? So uh, we have uh, a device called Simbo. Uh, so this device is, is pretty small and lightweight. It can be attached to almost onto any vehicle. And it consists of a, a LiDAR scanner and five cameras uh, inside it, as well as a computing platform. So you, you attach this onto a vehicle and you just drive through the environment and it collects all of the data. And, and, and this is one of the key things to understand with the voxel maps. We're, we're not mapping just one asset at a time. You know, traditional GIS is you go out there, if you're mapping streetlights, you go and take images of the streetlights and get a fix and write down attributes and take measurements, and you have a database just of one asset. This actually creates the full 3D uh, scene. So you, you map once, um, you measure everything, and then you've got that data that you can then run the AI and extract all of those, those features from as well. So just summing up uh, the, the benefits, uh, really when you're looking at this, you can rapidly map cities much, much faster uh, to create this data set and extract assets. Um, and it's much more uh, cost effective as well. You're using smaller teams to do that. And again, this isn't just about mapping. It's not just about knowing where something is. It's also about uh, measuring and taking down addi you know, additional attributes which can be useful for you uh, in particular. I mentioned before about reducing costs. So to, to give you an idea, you know, projects that would have taken team, you know, large teams of uh, people, weeks to do, can be done by a couple of units going around the city in, in a week or two, depending obviously on the, the, the size of the system. And as I said before, it's the ability for you to get truly 3D and to map everything. Even if you don't necessarily need additional assets in the beginning, uh, there's no additional cost for you to actually do the mapping process uh, you can always map everything and then look to extract a little bit later on. So I hope that gives you a very quick uh, overview uh, on, on this. Um, I'd love to answer any questions, Angela, that you might have on this uh, or from anybody else as well. Thanks, Peter. And I do actually have um, a couple of things coming in from the question box as well as chat. 
Um, so this is from Dave and he's asking, can this be tied the information that you gather to existing GIS information? Absolutely, yeah. So, so very often, a lot of the customers we have at the moment, what they want is the output into their traditional formats. And so whether that's shape or you know, different, different formats that they have, we can recognize, extract, and export into any data format as well. So it can be ingested either by the GIS platform they're using or the asset tracking platform they might be using as well. Great. So our next question is getting a little bit more into, and you, you kind of talked about reducing the cost, but in terms of mapping and price, for example, you know, how, how can you explain a little bit about how you price in, in terms of going out to, to map a city? For example, if a city's come to you, which we hear most often in, in our line of work, where a city's struggling to understand how many light poles they actually own yep. um, in their territory. Um, and I know one of the things, and I should have mentioned this on the front end before I ask you to answer that question, is um, we, as in addition to being friends with uh, Voxel Maps, um, we're both uh, members of the Sourcewell Cooperative Purchasing Program. So that's probably a good footnote to add before you talk a little bit about, you know, pricing and, and mapping using that poll example. Sure, sure, absolutely. So it really kind of depends on uh, the requirements from the city. You know, we, we either have a situation whereby, you know, a city is looking to map, you know, what, just one asset. You know, they, they have the, the benefit of having all the data for everything else, but they have a requirement for one asset. So, so in that situation, we charge per asset. And, and that's really based on the volume, the, the size and the scope of, of what we're doing. The, the other model is where we charge per mile. And so there we look at the, the overall city, we collect all of the data, um, so you have an initial price per mile that, that we're collecting the data at. That then produces a full 3D model that you can utilize. And then we can extract all the features from that data set as well. Now, the advantage with that is then you, you're kind of future proofing. You know, you have a model that you can keep, uh, which is easy to update as well. Um, and you can always look at that data and, and look at different attributes you might need over time. And even if it's an attribute that, or a feature, that, um, that we don't currently extract, we can do the custom training of the AI to recognize those features. And, and pretty much if a human can recognize it, then, then we can train the, the AI to recognize it with very high degrees of accuracy as well. Great. And I, and I do want to tag on to that question a little bit as well, because, you know, when we got excited and we met Voxel Maps for the first time, it was because, as I mentioned, we see a lot of our, our clients who struggle with knowing where their assets are. And, and so for us, we offer a, a platform and, and that's where we saw the synergies between our two organizations because we can take the data that Peter and his team extract um, on the city's behalf and then we can enable that data and bring it to life from an everyday perspective for the city by putting it into our platform where we can then utilize that platform to start end-to-end -end managing the life cycle of those assets. So for example, using the poll um, as, as a great example, if we have that data, um, we can take that data, dump that into our platform, and then begin to manage that light pole, for example all the specifications of that light pole so that when a carrier from the industry is interested in that asset in your community, that platform then comes to life for you um, and starts managing the application processes internally for your organization. Um, and what's exciting about this is that you can map that data more quickly, which then enables you to start online management and program management of those assets more quickly back to industry. And I know right now in the current environment where there is such a push for 5G deployment, that's becoming more and more of a pressure point for cities around the country to try to understand where those assets are and how to bring them to life. And then from an ongoing perspective, continue that life cycle of that asset. And so that's really where SmartWorks and Voxel Maps have partnered together. And I, I mentioned SourceWell, and I want to tag on to that pricing conversation. You know, as part of the SourceWell cooperative, um, there's already agreed upon pricing within that cooperative. And if you're a member of SourceWell, um, I would encourage you to inquire about that um, because it's, it's a fairly exclusive arrangement that we have, and, and it enables you to avoid the RFP and RFI situations when you're trying to move quickly to gather what your assets are and then start to utilize them 
um, in broadband master planning exercises. So I wanted to circle back on that. Um, I want to do just a moment of housekeeping. I appreciate several questions that we've already received. If you have um, questions, you can either enter those through the Q&A box or also through the, the chat box. I'm monitoring both of those um, so we can take those questions live for you um, during the call. Um, so I know we've gotten to Dave, we've gotten to Sean, so let me put another call out there to see other questions in, in the audience. All right, I see one more. Um, so in terms of mapping faster, um, you'd mentioned, Peter, that it can take a couple of weeks depending on the size of the city, but what is the role of the city in that mapping? Is there anything that they personally have to do to enable that mapping? Or once the baton is handled, handed to you, does that really become kind of your team's project? Yeah, again, it very much depends on, on kind of the, the city and the approach that they have as well. So. I'd say the typical arrangement is that we manage the process end to end. So normally, you know, they, they specify an area, what they want to have mapped. Um, we, we do the rest, you know, so it's our hardware vehicles, people that go out, collect the data, process the data and deliver the data back to them. So they, they don't really need to get involved in that stage. There are some exceptions to that. So some cities, um, you know, have pretty ambitious plans in terms of really modeling their cities and having, you know, true 3D data. And it's a long-term investment, and, and they already start to, to map themselves. They have teams of their own people doing this kind of thing. In, in that solution, uh, we're more of a solutions provider. So we actually provide the hardware, the software, the support, the training around it, um, and then they go out and do the, the, the mapping themselves. So both models work. I'd say that the first is, is more typical where we're doing it end-to-end. -end. Great. Thank you. So the next question I've seen come in is, is there a video of the process as an example? We may not be able to utilize it here live, but something that we could distribute after the call. Absolutely. I, I, I can try and share a video of the, uh, the mapping. Let me just see if that streams. Hopefully people can see this. So what we're looking at here is the, the actual live data coming from the device. Uh, this first scene, if, if everybody can see it, is the LiDAR data, the, the raw data that's uh, been collected. Um, so this is the, the laser scanner that's sitting on top of the device measuring everything. So you can start to see how those points are being, being created. And then as you start to see now, we switch into the voxel world. And this is where we're now starting to layer on the, the imaging data uh, that comes from that. So, so really starting to create a true environment, an environment that we can, we can recognize and understand much more. And, and that's key then for the next stage, which is the AI, because once the AI um, starts working on it, it needs to have not just the, the LiDAR data, but it also needs to have the image and the camera data to really get that really high recognition of the features as, as well as being able to measure those features as well. So a little bit further in this video, I'll just fast forward it. Yeah, just around here. So you can see here that it's now recognizing key features as well. So the, the blocks that you see over it are the AI then working on top of that data and really understanding what, uh, what those different types of assets are. But I, I can make these, these videos available as well and send the links after the, after the call um, so people can look at them in their free time and share them. Awesome. So our next question is, um, does the AI also recognize existing small cell locations? Um, it can recognize pretty much, at the moment, it, it's been trained more on, on sort of larger items of infrastructure. But as long as we can provide it examples, you know, that, that are visual, that a human can recognize, then we can train the, the AI to do it. So typically the training process, depending on the complexity of the object that we're looking to, uh, to recognize, is anywhere from a week to about three weeks for the training. Um, and then it's ready to deploy. Now, the, the good thing here is you don't need to go and remap again. You, know, you can still collect the data, and if it's a new feature you want to extract, we just train the AI and run it over that data set. So it's, it's not like the traditional approach where you, you map one, you know, one at a time and constantly be going out in, into the field. Great. So what's the process if you want to tag or identify ownership of an asset? Um, is that something that comes from the data once you gather it, or is that really where you pass the baton on that? 
Yeah, it's probably where we, we pass the baton. Um, but there are some exceptions to that. You know, some, some you know, assets have you know, different things which are very identifiable. And uh, if that's the, 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 you know, the case in the scenario, then that's, that's pretty easy for us to do. Um, we, can, we can recognize those features and we can extract it out as a data set that you know, is owned by you know, a particular company. Uh, but what we generally see, you know, see that happens is we extract those features and then it's normally down to the city uh, or you know, to, to you guys as well to, to kind of work, at, work that side of it out. Great. All right. So I've been handling questions that have been coming in via text message, our chat room and Q&A. Um, I'm looking right now to see if we have other questions coming from the folks on the line with us today. So let me pause and give everyone a minute. Um, I know we've presented a lot of data today to see if there are any other questions um, from panelists. Oh, I do see another one coming in. Um, how about pedestrian sidewalks or the condition of roads um, in terms of capturing that? Yeah, so, so sidewalks walks absolutely. And there's, there's a lot of uh, demand actually for sidewalks and curbs and curb heights at the moment. It's a, it's a very popular asset that people are looking at. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons around, you know, maintaining them, compliance, but also interestingly, we've seen over here in San Francisco, uh, the requirement for uh, automated delivery. And so, you know, you're looking at, you know, not just the big autonomous vehicles like the cars, but these smaller delivery vehicles needing to have this enhanced data of sidewalks, drop curbs, and, and that kind of thing. So, so we do a lot, you know, around that. In terms of condition of the road, um, yes, we, we do that. Um, that can be more complicated depending on the requirements as well. So I'd say at one level, absolutely, we do it. If we're needing to get down to the millimeter level in terms of the accuracy of the road surface, we're not currently supporting that. Um, it's not beyond us. It's just the resolution of where we are with the voxels around two centimeters won't show up everything. So it kind of depends on the, the requirements that the, the customer has there. Awesome. Um, I have a, another question coming in. What about drones? Yeah, really good. So, so, and this is kind of the continuation on from the, uh, what we call the high definition uh, mapping for autonomous vehicles. So again, most people think of autonomous vehicles just from the point of view of, uh, you know, of autonomous cars that might be driving around a city. And they do really need a very high definition uh, map. I mean, when you're looking at any form of autonomy or robotics, you know, humans uh, can work with normal data and, and the traditional data that you see on your mobile phone or on Google Maps is typically accurate to around a meter or so, you know, which is you know, sort of three feet. So it's not hugely accurate. Uh, a robot or an autonomous vehicle needs to locate itself within 20 centimeters or less, ideally around 10 centimeters. And the same is true for drones as well. So when you're looking at drones for drone delivery, you now need to start looking really at 3D, not just the, the 2D geometry of where the roads are, but the buildings and also where you can start to drop off. And so we've started a, a project with one very large company here in the Bay Area which is actually mapping the tops of buildings and also looking at balconies as well and looking at the feasibility then of enabling drone-based delivery and drone navigation truly in, in 3D space. Great. I have another question. Um, do you need access to a voxel maps portal to view the AR rendered data? Uh, yes and no. So, so if you want to utilize the voxels, yes. Uh, so the, the platform we would provide is, uh, is a portal plus a tool set as well that you can explore the data and, and analyze it yourself. We can do all of that for you, but if, if you want to do that yourself, that's, that's totally fine and we can give you access to those tools. Um, but some cities aren't quite ready for full 3D yet, so, so they, they want to take the advantage of you know, more accurate, faster mapping, but the output that they need is just in their traditional formats. And, and in those situations, we just provide the data in their format. They don't even need to touch our tool set at all. Um, so it really kind of depends the, you know, the appetites of the, of the city or the client um, and what the requirements are for their particular project. Great. And then I had another question just talking about, you know, what about tree canopies when it comes to mapping? Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the things that actually, if I share my screen again, so everybody can see that. So, so this is what we're doing here. So we're, we're measuring here um, trees and tree canopies as well. Um, there's, there's two sides of that. You know, we can see a lot of the tree, the, the, the growth of the tree as well. So not just trees, also looking at vegetation, the size of the canopy, and also is it now starting to encroach onto you know, other assets and infrastructure? 
you know, be that telegraph poles, cables, lights, you know, et cetera. So we do that kind of analysis. Um, there, there is some analysis for canopies which needs to be done from an aerial perspective if we're talking about a very high uh, you know, canopy, but it's, it's rare. I'd say most of what we do, the ground-based stuff is, is entirely sufficient and kind of gives great data that you can, you can analyze and you can go from. Great. All right, I've seen a slowdown there for just a moment in the question and answer box. So I'll do another call out for those that are attending today. Other, other questions or information that either myself or, or Peter can provide for you today, um, you can enter those either in Q&A or you can also utilize the, the chat box for those questions. So I'll pause for just a moment and let everyone give some thought to see if there are any closing questions. Um, I think we've got about eight to 10 minutes left in our time. So certainly we want to make sure we're respecting the time of all of our attendees. All right, um, I see another question coming in uh, talking about what is the relationship uh, between our two organizations. Um, so I'll touch on that again. Um, in terms of SmartWorks partners and Voxel Maps, so on the SmartWorks partners side of the house, we work with municipalities around the country, helping them broadband master plan. Um, and I know that term can get thrown around uh, very, with a very broad brush on many ways. And so essentially, we work with clients around the country to do a full program management for them, meaning we can become as granular as helping you rewrite your ordinances um, to make sure that you're accounting for the FCC rulings um, that have come to play in this past year um, for your um, right-of-way assets. Uh, we can help you identify those assets using our partner Voxel Maps to gather that data for you. And then we can take the data um, for the assets you own that we know um, have value to the industry in terms of building that 5G network. And we can take that data and enable it through our platform and manage those assets on your behalf. Um, and when we talk about manage, that's when program management comes into play for us. We, we manage the life cycle of that asset from the moment it's identified and entered into our platform. Um, we can create an entire streamlined application process for your municipality so that you do not have to be concerned about whether or not you're abiding by shot clocks and, and those types of things that come into play when we're talking about assets that the industry would like to deploy small cells on. And so we've entered into a strategic partnership with Voxel Maps through our SourceWell um, cooperative purchasing agreement so that we can help our client base more quickly identify their assets. As I, I mentioned um, earlier in our broadcast, that is one of the issues that we run into most often is that we find that understanding where the assets are located is a, is a big part of the puzzle and can slow the process down. And so that's where we see the value of utilizing Voxel Maps um, to help us more quickly identify the assets. Um, in, in terms of um, our partnership, um, we have, um, use their services in, in terms of helping us understand more quickly how we can map and measure um, all those assets within a city. And, and what I think is unique about the relationship, and Peter kind of hit on that earlier, is that this goes beyond just the assets for building a 5G network. And that was the focus of our call today, is to talk about how crucial the role of your infrastructure is in deploying that network and the small cells and, and handling the applications that you're starting to receive from the industry but the software itself is is much more broad and so it can play a role in many aspects within your municipality um, i do see a couple of uh, final questions coming through q a as well uh, one of those questions is can you map in building and subterrain yes yes no so, so that's a really interesting one um the, the vox model as i mentioned before actually goes through the whole of the planet and so the, the same addressing system that works outside works inside buildings and works subterranean as well. So we have solutions uh, which will map indoors. And so it's a backpack version of the, uh, the Simbo. Uh, and so what you need to do there is you map the outside of the building first, and then it starts to map the inside of the building. So you'd walk around with a device which will then reduce the 3D map, all within the same kind of framework. You know? so, so it's the same referencing addressing system that, that you have. Um, subterranean mapping, yes, totally possible. It's a little bit more complicated. 
Um, so there we wouldn't be using our hardware for doing that. Uh, you can use things like ground penetrating radar. Um, you don't typically get the same resolution as you would do with obviously uh, using LIDAR. So uh, for subterranean, normally they're much larger voxels, but it can give you an idea of what's, uh, what's underneath as well, all within one you know, truly 3D uh, model or map. Great. Um, it looks like I've got a couple more questions coming in. So in terms of um, accessing the data, um, when it comes into the SmartWorks Partners platform, um, yes, the city can access that data once we receive it and put it into our platform, as Peter mentioned. Um, and you do have the ability to take our platform and we can interface with other data management tools that you may have in place already within your municipality. And I know that's often a roadblock that we hear about is there may have been a tool that was purchased for a different feature or functionality. Um, and they want to be able to integrate the information and we do have the ability to, to do that uh, with the platform that we provide um, and, and work with each of the unique situations um, that we run across on a daily basis around the country. Um, so that is the good news there. Um, other questions um, for either myself or, or Peter that we can address while we're on the call together today. I'm seeing it start to slow down. Oh, another one. Um, there is, um, there was just an FYI provided by one of my colleagues in terms of uh, the platform. Uh, once we receive that data, there are secure logins for both the cities and the providers um, in, in terms of utilizing that data. So once we receive those assets, the only time those assets can be seen or viewed is unique logins for the providers. Um, so they only have access to the assets that they're interested in um, and, and vice versa for the cities. You have a secure login separately for yourself as well on the SmartWorks platform. Other questions or comments from the folks on the call today? I have us approaching about 45 minutes after the hour, and I know we promised in the registration that we would keep this to, to 45 minutes. So um, I certainly appreciate all of the participation and the questions from the audience today. Peter, any final thoughts from, from you today before we, we let all the folks get back to their busy days? No, I think uh, those, there were great questions there. So if there, anybody requires any more information, then do feel free to, to reach out to Angela or myself. Uh, we'd be very happy to, to share the information we presented, uh, plus some videos as well and, and answer anything else. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed, Peter. We'll make sure we follow up with everyone. And if we can be of service, please don't hesitate to call upon either one of us. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.